candidly, candidly, I had a few months there when I had jumped off where I was wrestling with it. I was exhausted. I was stressed and um, I could have totally turned back. When I left corporate America, I actually went through a divorce process shortly thereafter. And I had a lot of people counsel me and or so-called counsel say, Kate, just go back and get a day job. There's a difference between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Thanks all for tuning in to Dream Catchers, where we make things happen. Dream Catchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self-motivated individuals who desire to take their life's work to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dreams. Are you ready? Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome, and I've got the great pleasure of having Kate from Minneapolis with me. Kate, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm amazing. So I do things a little backwards as usual. How can the listeners get in contact with you after they hear your amazing story? (laughs) Well, the best way to get in touch with me is actually by email. So you can reach out to me at Kate, K-A-T-E, at noble.com. And I'll spell that for you. Kate at E-N-N-O-B-B-L-E.com. Kate at e double n o double b l e dot com. See, when I first met Kate, I went to her website and usually people have testimonials or social proof and she has evidence. And I was like, <laughs> this is wonderful. I've never heard anybody put evidence as if they're on trial. But I mean, the fact of the matter is when you're in the space that you're in, a lot of people are trying to figure out if you're the real deal. And Absolutely. Kate has so many um, I'll, I'll call them cases, some verdicts <laughs> where she's delivered results for her clients. And so with that said, Kate, tell the listeners a little bit about, you know, what you do currently, but more so how you got to the place that you are right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I run a company called Ennoble and I'm a brand strategist and really my whole job is to build brands that win more work. Um, The focus of my organization is to help entrepreneurs and companies of any size really articulate the message that's going to enable them to build common ground with their audiences so that they buy from you versus the competition. And the way that I do that is after doing this for over a decade, um, and I've built well over 150 brands and I've worked in over 20 sectors, um, I built it a proprietary process and I leverage a 30 page brand playbook that I wrote to help clients go very deep and wide through the process of collaboratively writing every piece of their brand that's going to enable them to get more prospects to the table, more users to click, and really at the end of the day, what do we want? More buyers. And so Jerome, the entire approach that I've taken is a bit different. It's, it's collaborative. It's in the room with the client versus unlike a lot of agencies where they'll go away for a few weeks and come back six weeks later and deliver a brand. And you're, you're sitting there going, wow, that is so not me. Um, my approach is completely different. My job is to extract from my client what their brand really is and help them synthesize that and articulate it in a way that's going to resonate with their audiences. So that's what I do in a nutshell. And I love it. And in only three to four weeks, um, my clients are walking away with an entire brand written and they know exactly where to implement it and how, and they're equipped with an elevator pitch, all of it. So that they feel like they can get out there and ultimately win more work, which is really what we want them to do. Whoa. So you made something really complicated and cumbersome simple, right? I mean, this is hard. People are trying to figure out how to explain what they do to people, especially if they're in like a service industry and they're solving a pretty unique problem. So how did you come to the place where you put this proprietary framework together? Like what happened? (laughs) So my journey is very, very interesting in the sense that, you know, um, 
like many older millennials and 35, um, we graduated around the time that the market crashed back in 2008. And at the time, I was looking to pursue a PhD in anthropology. I really wanted to teach and be in academia. And I was very, very much focused around how can I help tell stories of cultures and places, places through something called ethnography. It's really the practice of how to research and tell stories as an anthropologist. Very similar to sociology if you're not familiar with anthropology. Anyway, um, market crashed. And I remember I had a professor look me dead in the eye and he said, get out now. And I thought, well, what do you mean? He said, get out now. Candidly, we don't know where academia is going to shift in the next 10 years. And I highly recommend that you go and get yourself a job. And so I did, I left academia and I took my first uh, sales and marketing gig. And I had a number of jobs through them in the last you know, decade or so, but really what happened was that was a tipping point for me was I, I took a job at an IT training company doing sales, cold calling IT people over the phone, which clearly, cause that sounds like a smart idea, right? Because not only do IT people love to talk on the phone, but then they love to be sold to. No, this could have been like the, this was like the, not the smartest thing for a 20 something to do. Of course, I'm like, great, I'll totally do it. Well, here I am and 90 days in, I'm killing it. I'm doing really well. And I progressed to have a $1.2 million a year pipeline, um, cold calling IT people over the phone. And at one point, the head of sales and marketing came over to my desk and they said, what are you doing? And I'm like, what do you mean, what am I doing? And they're like, well, you're doing really well. Like, can, just curiously, like, you know, because we gave you the sales scripts and the email scripts and all this stuff, like, what is it that you're doing differently? And I said, oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I hated your scripts. I totally got rid of them. I wrote my own. And I was like a problem child and they died laughing, but they're just like, oh my God. So I said, well, what are you writing? What are you saying? And I had written just this really simple thing, just three points I said, hey, this is Kate and this is what I do. This is how I solve your problem. And this is how I'm different. And it worked. It worked. It's all I needed to say to get these people to actually want to have a conversation with me and find a solution that was really going to be provide value to them. And it was a light bulb moment that went off in my brain as I'm sitting here talking with the head of sales and marketing that, yeah, I'm, I'm good at wordsmithing, but really what I had crafted was a pretty simple formula for how to tell a story in 30 seconds or less to get that prospective buyer to really want to have a conversation with me. And that was the catalytic moment. So fast forward, I got recruited out to work in the agency world, got recruited from there to work in the corporate sector. And all the while for over 10 years, I was the quintessential professional side hustler, taking this little secret talent and building branding on the side and doing brands. And so now, you know, 10 years later, I made the side hustle, the official hustle, which amazing. And, and there's been no looking back. That's really it is it was a light bulb moment in my early 20s that transpired into many years of iterating and refining this process to be the most anti-marketing process you could probably go through to write a brand. Well, so tell me the three steps again. Absolutely. So what I teach and what I teach every single client is three things. It is the crux of a brand message that works. It includes a tagline a value proposition statement and differentiator statements. And they go in that order. A tagline should say, this is what I do. Boom, to the point, short, sharp, less than five or six words in your face. And then you've got something that follows along with that, which is called a value proposition statement. And that's really just lovely marketing speak for a statement that says, this is how I solve your problem. It should be short again. It should be kind of a call to action statement that says, do this so you get that. And then you've got differentiator statements, which clearly say in a few big bullet points, this is how I'm different than the competition. One, two, three, four, boom. And the reality is that consumers today are very, very smart and they don't wanna be talked at, they wanna have a conversation. And so the brand trifecta, which is what I call it, of tagline, value prop and differentiators creates conversation because it's really about provoking the person who's reading it or hearing it to go, well, what do you mean by that? Really, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? 
great branding doesn't tell, it provokes. And so everything that I do when I teach client is about the word provocation in a way that is truthful, it's authentic, and it can be backed up by the value you deliver. That's it. So you want to provoke your customers? Absolutely. You want to provoke them to know more. There's no storytelling. Everybody says, oh, conversation, storytelling. Guess what? There's no conversation unless the other person goes, really? What do you mean? Hmm. Tell me more. Ooh. Ooh. I've never heard anybody characterize it that way. Okay. And so you... You tore up the script, you threw it away. Mm -hmm. Then you got recruited out because you were having success and other people said, oh, well, I bet you can do that for us too. Then you, while you were building it on the side. And so when did you decide to leave the paycheck behind, leave that addiction behind <laughs> and go do uh, your own thing? Yeah, great question. So um, gosh, you know, candidly, it was about three and a half years ago that I started to really think about that. Um, I had a young kid at the time, she was two. Um, and I was in a place in my life, Jerome, where I actually was not happy. I was really not happy. I'd hit kind of the, the pinnacle of success at my job. I was at a director level position, um, doing great work. And I, I was like, okay, I can stay here, you know, for another three to five years and hopefully acquire a team and hopefully get the director title and all of these things. Um, I was making very good money. But at what cost? I was exhausted. I was stressed. I, I, was, I was really depressed, to be very candid with you. And I was at a point in my life where I was really at a low. And I remember that there was a day about three and a half years ago that I looked in the mirror. And I remember seriously thinking to myself, I hate myself. Ooh, now, this... nobody's supposed to tell you that on a podcast. But yes, that was, honest to God, what happened. Yes, they are. That's the red pill moment. Keep going. So I looked at myself and I realized I hated myself. And then I looked at myself again and I decided either I change or nothing changes. And I made a decision that I was going to figure out how in the hell to actually learn how to love myself for the first time in my life. That was it because I had never loved myself. I spent most of my life not being on brand, uh, not living my brand. Um, trying to be somebody else's brand, trying to be who I thought I was supposed to be, who the world thought I was supposed to be. I had a lot of mindsets and, and belief systems that were not serving me anymore. And so I had to determine what the heck was this going to be. And I went on the perilous, very, very scary, very, very wickedly courageous journey of deciding to figure out what it means to look my crap in the eye. And that was the beginning. So I started therapy. I started, you know, taking care of myself differently. I started saying no to stuff. I started saying yes to things that I liked. I started to get curious about what my purpose was. I started to actually decide what could a life that I really want look like. And that was it. Fast forward about a year and a half from that moment. And at the time I was finding success personally, I was growing. And all of a sudden my little side hustle was blowing up. And I had to make a decision. Could I figure out a way to work my way out of my day job? You know, I have a family. It's not like I could just up and leave, right? I, I had to make sure that I was being fiscally responsible. And so I decided to give myself about a year to match my money and match my income and get out. And I did. So that was a year and a half ago. And even since I left, um, the success has been incredible. Not because I think, Jerome, that I've done anything, but maybe more of because who I've become. So this is really interesting because you're the first person I've talked to who's been able to match your income. And I assume you're over a six figure earner because of mm -hmm. your title. And so what is the secret to building that much fee in your side hustle? Because I mean, yeah. you actually have to fulfill Mm -hmm. what you sell it's not some widget that they can buy off amazon or a thing you know an info product it's it's you i mean you're selling your time yeah well first off i'll give you a fair warning that <laughs> i learned through a lot of mistakes during that process of overworking 
overworking. And so I will give you this major, major caveat to say that in the process of figuring all of this out, I was a workaholic for about a year there. And I had to learn to scale back big time. What happened that allowed me to scale back though was this. There's two big things that, and I, every single client that does my programming, we go through an entire portion of the project focus on this. Number one is figuring out how do you niche in? Because the tendency is, is the moment that you're like, I have something to give the world. You go, I'm going to give everything to everybody. Wrong. Technically speaking, everybody needs branding. Technically speaking, not everybody cares nor needs it in their mind. So I had to decide that I was willing to totally own the fact that I was going to do a really good job selling only one thing to one group of people. I sell one product offering, which is a branding package, to startups and small businesses. That is it. That's the first thing is I niched in. The second thing is that the moment you make the decision to niche in, and there's somebody that said like niches lead to riches, which I think is great, but it's actually true, um, is you've got to build what I call the 70%. So if you are in B2B services, especially, this is very typical. Most people are, have very complex processes of what they deliver. Um, it's they're charging monthly, which there's nothing wrong with that, but it creates a lot of, strain on you to be able to continually deliver the work and to acquire new clients while you're delivering in the work. So I had to figure out a way to deliver my service like I would a product. And the only way to do that was to build the 70%. It was a process of building my brand playbook, which is over 30 pages long, and getting that so dialed in as a template and as a backbone for the way that I run my program so that the 30% is where I could get in the room with the client and be freed up to do the creative work and extract their brand from them and help them synthesize and help them wordsmith. So a lot of clients that I work with, Jerome, it's helping them actually build the program. They've got a great idea. They don't have any documents. They have no processes in place. They don't have a lot of these pieces that allow it to be repeatable. But what happens is, is it's a time suck and therefore it becomes a money suck and they cannot they're like on a hamster wheel. They can't seem to get around the wheel to get to revenue growth. Ooh. It's custom for everybody, not a business. No, the brand <laughs> is custom for everybody. So that's what's interesting. Every single brand I read is unique, but I'm able to do that because I've got the process built. So when I get in the room, we're free to have the conversation. That's the secret. So who showed up to help you along the way? Oh my gosh. Um, so I'm a firm believer in get yourself some mentors or some coaches that have been there, done that. So I uh, have had a number of incredibly strong females in my life that all have a solid 20 plus years of experience and life beyond me. And they are the ones that have mentored me along the way. And they've been not only successful in their businesses, but successful in all areas of their life. They achieved that sense of purpose and balance and inner confidence that I looked at them and I go, I want that. And so I made the decision when I was ready to start to really build my business and scale to get out of my day job that I had to get a coach and I didn't know what I didn't know. So I was willing to bank everything on actually investing in myself in this area. And that was the best decision I ever made. I'm like going, wait a second, I pay for a gym membership. You know, I'll pay for the fancy foods. I pay for the lattes. What if I cut out some of those things and start working out from home and put the money towards coaching? What would that do for me? And so I did, I moved money around and I figured out how to do it. And, um, it completely shifted everything for me. So, okay. Most people, you said you didn't know what you didn't know. I call it consciously incompetent. You know that you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. There's a lot of people who are unconsciously incompetent and they think they know what they don't know, 
right. I'm not overconfident, right? Right. And so you made the investment in coaching, which a lot of people say, why do I need a coach? I already know what I'm doing, but you don't. And because you don't, you're going around in circles and not making progress or you're making it okay that you're not actually making progress because you can tell yourself, hey, not a big deal. Self-love, be kind. And having to go talk to somebody about that is a little more motivating than having to deal with it yourself. So through this process, you <laughs> you were working, I, I suspect probably 80 hours a week, if not more. You had a little one. Yep. And I suspect you said, I don't feel like doing this anymore. It's not worth it at some point. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so why'd you have to keep going? When did you say that? And what did you do? Because I made a commitment to myself that I wanted to live my purpose. I tried it the other way for 30 some years. What's up tribe, it's your host Jerome. I just wanna let you know that we put together a free 15 point checklist for exiting the matrix. Jump on over to dreamshouldbereal.com in order to pick your free copy up. Let's get back to the show. Either I was going to bank on the fact that I could live the life I wanted when I decided to live my purpose or I wasn't. And so for me to live my purpose meant digging myself out of the holes that I dug, being willing to admit that I don't know everything, <laughs> get around incredibly smart people, work hard, but truly stand in who I am. There's no, there's no, you can't, you can't disconnect the two. If you want success in your life and you're saying you're to yourself, I want to be an entrepreneur and I want to innovate and I want to change the world. You have to change yourself. If you want to change the world, everything yeah. starts between your two ears. Everything you can't starts say that. You can't say that. That's, that's not acceptable. Uh, it is very acceptable. <laughs> I've probably taken about 20 red pills at this point, Jerome. It's fine. It's fine. No, <laughs> this is awesome. Okay. So you decided that you had to be the change that you wanted to see in the world. Yeah. And you were totally committed to it. There was no going back. You were done. It, yeah. This was it. Because once you taste that freedom, once you start experiencing living in your purpose, living in your genius zone on a daily basis, you can't go back. You're not, probably not employable anymore. I'm completely not employable. I'd be a terrible employee. I also would be a terrible manager. Like, let's be honest. This is why I outsource to really other smart people that are great at stuff. You know what I mean? There's, I'm like, there, that would be absolutely terrible. Part of it is, I think, realizing that um, the moment we're bold enough to wake up and realize that we want to change ourselves and the moment we start to believe like, wow, I am valuable or I am worthy um, to say, if I am worthy, I can provide a thing that is of worth to somebody else. I had a big shift, Jerome, that went from me thinking as an entrepreneur that it was all about just delivery of work and making money and hoping to God that would fulfill me to I'm worthy. I have purpose. And if I live that, I can provide this thing going to enable other people to step into theirs. I have a thing I can deliver that is also of value. But what was phenomenal about that process is it no longer was the work then defining my value and my confidence. I was able to finally separate myself out as a person from what I was delivering. And that was the sweet spot. So I could show up every day, do incredible work with my clients, but my confidence no longer hinged on whether they liked me or not, no, what, no, whether or not I was winning work or not, whether or not they bought for me, whether or not anybody liked anything I did. Because it shifted from leading from a place of desperation to leading from a place of invitation. When you stand in who you are, you invite others into that story and they will buy from you. 
when you are striving to want to fulfill something and fulfill something in yourself, you leave from a place of desperation and it pushes people and greatness away. Ooh, so this is the law of attraction, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the red pill, there's six layers. The center layer is self-image. And so mm -hmm. what you just described is working on your self-image, getting things together. And once you improve the relationship with yourself, you attract people to you. The second level is relationships who are interested in that energy that you're putting off and that confidence that you exude and all of the things that you just described. And so this is super exciting because you got to go to the nucleus. And once the nucleus is right and tight, all the other stuff that you build off of that is going to work because it's in alignment. And Completely. anything that's not in alignment, and you do this with brands, I'm sure, anything yeah. that's not in alignment, they go away. It's just mm -hmm. not for them. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be for everybody. It is, you know, it's funny, all my customers, you know, they go, okay, I've got to figure out, figure out my target audiences. Who am I going to sell to? Right. I'm like, great. And part of the conversation, which is super fascinating is, um, and especially with entrepreneurs, because we often define ourselves as our business and vice versa, because it's our baby, um, is helping them understand that you don't need to be everything for everybody. And what would it look like if you just serve a group really, 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 really well? And they just loved you and you loved them. What would that do? What would, how, how would that shift? Um, you make an interesting comment though about getting the nucleus right. Um, in my opinion, that work is never done. And so the tendency for being so type A is when I started this journey, I was like, great, I did six months of coaching and I'm fixed. This is fabulous. And then I hit another roadblock and I was like, oh crap, you know? And it, so I have learned in the last number of years, like never stop being coached, never stop learning, never stop surrounding yourself by really smart people that have gone before you. And I'm really committed to that as like a lifelong journey. And instead of me feeling ashamed, because at first when I was started this journey, I didn't like who I was. And I, I was really just, I felt ashamed by that. There was a lot of fear and a lot of shame that I had to deal with. And instead of now seeing myself as broken, I see myself as human. Instead of looking at these things from a place of shame and fear, like, oh God, I'm so messed up and I can't believe I've been believing these lies. And oh, look at the way that I even look, talk to myself. Now I'm getting curious. So instead of being in a place of shame and fear, I'm now in a place of curiosity. The more that you commit to fixing what's between your ears, the more that you can be curious about who you are as an individual and how, what you can provide to others. Ooh. So David Metzler talks about being more interested than interesting. And I feel like that's just a, another way of saying what you just said with mm -hmm. being curious. Um, yeah. And when you're curious, there is no judgment. It's just like, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. And that is super exciting because you can learn so much from people when you're actually curious about their perspective and point of view. I've, I've seen some things that were unkind where people are just dismissive and not really interested in hearing other opinions. And that for me is challenging because mm -hmm. there is no growth if nobody can share anything or tell you anything. And I think we can learn from everybody. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that perspective. Kate, would you be willing to talk about some of the challenges, maybe two or three on the journey? Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I have faced in the last uh, 10 years is moving from a place of striving, moving from a place of striving in, in, in general. I'm very type A, I'm a go-getter. I, I, you know, I can do the sales and I can go and I can win the work. And, but I had to really work very methodically and very intentionally to learn how to run my business and more importantly, learn how to live from a place of being versus doing. I think as entrepreneurs, we get caught up in the doing because the world tells us market harder and faster, learn this, do that, build this. You know, I actually made a decision a few years ago, I wasn't going to read any self-help books for a while. I actually had to make that commitment to myself because I realized I was allowing 
noise to come in and I couldn't even hear my own voice and my own gut feeling about who I should be and what I should do. And so there was a season of time where I had to almost intentionally cut out what everybody else was recommending to me and trust the couple people in my life that were really speaking truth, you know, my mentors, my coaches, and, 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 and follow their voice and in turn learn how to follow my own. So that was been one of my challenges is moving from striving, moving from doing into being, and it required me to cut the noise for a period of time. I had to actually learn how to hear myself. So many people are scared of the quiet though, Kay. How, how dare you? How dare you stop consuming and go inside? What, what's wrong with you? A lot. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm a hot mess. It's fine. It's fine. No. Um, yeah, it's scary, isn't it? And no. It, it, it's scary at first. And then the moment that you go quiet and then you realize like you have stuff you can say to yourself and that you can trust your gut. Well, that's big. See, I had never trusted my gut before. I had trusted tactics. Okay, if I do this and I do this, it's gonna do this. But I'd never learned how to trust um, peace, like the deep peace that you feel when you make a decision that you know is right for you. I was always second guessing it based on is that in line with that blog that I read on how to market my business? Is that in line with what Gary Vee said about this? You know, like we're always second guessing. And I had to cut that out for quite a while to learn how to hear my own voice. And it brought me from a place, I think, of making decisions from a place of excitement to making decisions from a place of peace. Um, and I talk a lot about this because when we lead from a place of excitement or we make decisions from excitement, on the outside, that can seem really great. However, for me, excitement masked anxiety and fear because I just, I wanted a solution. Ah. So I was all excited. Now I lead from a place of peace. It's much more boring, Jerome. But I tell you, like when you lead from a place of peace, you make decisions from peace. You don't have backtracking from your decision anymore. Yeah. So I always get frustrated when people say, oh, I'm a busy professional, da, 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 da. So <laughs> like being busy isn't good. <laughs> it's not like being effective is good. Mm -hmm. Doing the things that actually are moving you forward and are on brand. Oh, we got to talk about that. All right. Like, but doing things that are on brand is good. So let's talk about being on brand because <laughs> I didn't hear that until about a year ago. And I was like, what in the world are you talking about? On brand? What is, what is on brand? What is on brand, Kate? Oh my God, what a loaded question, Jerome. Um, I love it. Honestly, like in layman's terms, being on brand mean, means being authentically 110% who you are as a person, as your organization. It's living in authenticity. It's living in purpose. It is putting the message out to the world and following up on it in a way that is truly grounded in a who you are as a worthy individual and the value you can provide to others. That's being on brand. Okay. So what about the people who don't like who they are? If we go back to, you know, you didn't like yourself, you were depressed. Like, are those people supposed to be on brand or do they put on this mask and act as if there's something or somebody else? And I'm sure this is going to get into be and do. I know be do have to, by the way. I would say to those people who are in a place where they don't like who they are, but they also have sense of responsibilities and they're just trying to make it. Maybe they're out there going, I've got to provide for my family and I've got a lot on my plate and I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders and I'm trying to get all this stuff done. No, you can't just drop what you're doing. So I would never say to somebody, just, just forget all this stuff you're doing. No, that's not reality. But what I would say is to be on brand means willing to find a safe space in your home, whether it's shutting the bathroom door and looking in the mirror like I did, or in your car, to be 110% authentically on brand. And if on brand for you that day means you need to cry it out, go cry it out. If being on brand means that you need to go and lift some heavy weights to get the anger out, then go do it. 
being on brand means learning how to feel in a different way and it means learning how to be. So start by finding pockets in your day where you feel safe to be. Those 10 minute intervals become a pile up of 10 minute upon 10 minute upon 10 minute upon 10 minute that all of a sudden take you from 10 minutes a day to 24 hours a day of learning how to live your brand. A- so I took you off track with Bidu and being on brand. Let's go back. So you gave me one of the challenges. Give me another one. Hmm. Another challenge as I've built my business and as I've gotten out there and I've stepped into this. You know, I would say another big challenge has been learning how to say um, no to stuff. (laughs) And this is pretty common, right? Because we're all excited and we're out there, we're doing things. And I wanted to take every meeting and every virtual coffee call and um, every networking event possible. And God, I hit burnout. I really did for a few months there. And I had to learn how to say no. I had to learn to say no to the good so that I could experience the great. And that included actually things in my personal life as well. You know, I, my friends always wanted to see me and um, I would, I would book like stuff almost every night of the week. Oh my goodness. Like that created such conflict where I was not even allowing myself time to come home and just mentally decompress. So I would say for people that are out there and they're working very hard and they're really trying to build this thing, make sure that you learn how to say no to the good so that you can experience the great. Sometimes good things distract us or hinder us from really experiencing great things in our life. For me, that was a lot of activity that was even great for in terms of I'm like, I'm out prospecting and I'm meeting people and I'm networking, but I actually had to look at my numbers and go back with my coach and realizing that, oh my gosh, these four places where I was doing networking were not leading to any any actual revenue. They were fun, but I wasn't getting prospects from them. And I had to be willing to say no to those types of networking commitments and instead focus on a couple where I was actually getting leads with people that genuinely found value in what I offered. So I had to say no to the good to experience the great. Ooh, that's hard, right? Because, well, you were a people pleaser prior to your exit from the matrix. So absolutely, that was really hard. Um, okay. So what was your worst fear in the process? My worst fear is what if it didn't work? What if it didn't work? Type A, I've been successful at all that I've done. It's supposed to happen. And now it's all on me. What if it doesn't work? Yeah. Fear of failure was my biggest fear for most of my life. Because again, if you go back and you understand that I spent most of my life afraid to really live who I was because I was trying, I was trying to put myself into other people's boxes and I was trying to put myself into my own boxes <laughs> that what happens if I step out of the boxes and I just be me, what if that doesn't work? The ultimate fear that I had was a fear of rejection. And it only, it wasn't until I actually loved myself fully that I realized that if the business didn't work, it was not a reflection on me. Because I actually liked who I was. That, that was a process. That was not an overnight thing. What do you mean it's not a reflection on you? How can that be? Hmm. Because it has everything to do with me finally realizing that who I was as a person was about being a worthy person of somebody of value, whether or not I did anything for anybody, because I'm human. And I have a right and a privilege to be alive right now and to be able to show up and be. 
and that I didn't need to do anything or be anything for anybody in order to be worthy of loving myself and being loved. At the end of the day, my trump card, the big thing that I have always wrestled with has been, what if I fail? And I had to actually ask myself, Jerome, what am I making failure mean to me? I was making failure of my business mean that I was a failure. And once you separate the two, you're free to fly. Mm -hmm. This is beautiful. And so was there a point when everything was on the line? Was there a rock bottom? Yeah, I mean, candidly, candidly, I had a few months there when I had jumped off where I was wrestling with it. I was exhausted. I was stressed and um, I could have totally turned back. When I left corporate America, I actually went through a divorce process shortly thereafter. And I had a lot of people counsel me and or so-called counsel say, Kate, just go back and get a day job. Just get a day job and just provide and just be steady. And they meant so well, they meant the world. But I had to go back, what's the risk I take if I don't finish this journey of living in my purpose? I had to go back to the moment of staring myself in the mirror. I had come so far. Was I seriously going to give that up because of a situation in my life that was not ideal, that affected not only me and my, my ex-spouse, but my child? No, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. It was tumultuous to say the least. It was hard, but I had to keep going in the process of that, that um, emotional stress and those changes in my life to be willing to know that what was coming down the path was greater. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. You have to keep going. I love it. I love it. So you said that somebody said, go get a job, Kate. Yes. Was there people on the other end saying, Kate, we have a job for you. Come back. Yes. Arms wide open. Come, come back. Come back. Leave the totally. desert. Come back into the jungle where it's cool and you can live in the shade and you can pick fruit from the trees instead of walking through this hot place with no water and you don't know where the next thing's coming from. Absolutely. Again, say no to the good to experience the great. So many people just go back, they get scared. They see, they can't see it, right? They lose sight of it, they lose the North Star. And in that they go back to the familiar and live a less than optimal life. So what are you most grateful for now that you're on the other side? Oh, first reaction, I'm most grateful for being in a place where I actually love who I am. That's the first thing. I'm so damn thankful I looked myself in the mirror and was willing to actually tell myself I hate myself. Most people go their whole lives without being willing to say that. I'm so glad I did. And I'm so grateful to have been in a position now where I help people live their purpose through branding in the hopes that I can help others really step out and experience that, to taste it. What does it look like? What does it feel like to own your expertise, to be on brand 100% authentically? And that's really what drives my work is, yeah, I love writing messaging. Yes, I love it. I wanna help you increase revenue. Yes, I want you to sell, but there's such a deeper thing that happens when I work with clients is to see their faces light up, that in the process of going through a branding exercise in a few weeks, they come out the other end a different person. They own it. They believe it. They get it. They're, they're, there's just a shift. That to me is the sweet spot that I'm so grateful for every day. It's a profound piece of work that I get to do, which I take really seriously. And I feel honored to be able to do it. And I realize I'm not just dealing with people messaging. I'm dealing with their businesses. And more importantly, I'm dealing with their lives. That's a precious place to be and you take it seriously. And so I'm grateful for that. Beautiful. Kate, what dream are you most focused on catching next? 
I'm in the process of writing a book. And interestingly enough, do you want to know what it's called? Yep. Not on brand. It is my recipe for how to build a brand, of course, for yourself and your business. But it is filtered throughout with the stories that I've shared today about my own personal journey of spending 30 some years not living on brand and what it has been for me to finally live my life on brand. What gift are you giving the world? Hope. Ooh, hope for what? Hope that they can live a life that's worthy and rich by showing up and being. Pregnant pause. I'm letting that one sink in, guys. Because if you don't have hope after listening to this, you're in a dark spot and you need to call somebody for help because this right here is super inspiring. Kay, I'm so grateful that you've been willing to get on brand after living off brand for so long. I'm so grateful that you're willing to sow into the lives of people who have these dreams and they're trying to manifest them, but they don't have the right words to share it with people so that people actually transact with them because having the dream and not being able to transact is something that's super deflating and it yeah. keeps people from actually making the full transition because they're unsure and unable to move to that new place. So I really appreciate the gifts that you're sharing with the world. I'm so grateful you. that you were so generous with your time with us today. Thank you, Jerome. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm honored and I can't tell you how much I love the work that you do. And if you guys have not taken the red pill, you need to call Jerome and take the red pill. I'm just going to put that out there. So um, thank you. Thank you for having me today and for allowing space for us to dialogue and share stories together. This has been phenomenal. And so for the final question, yeah. what's the one thing you want the listeners to take away from this conversation? Be bold enough you're at, to ask yourself, what would my life look like if I learned how to truly live my purpose? Living out your purpose, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't think that you get it. It just comes to you. I think you find it in your work, right? It, yep. So guys, this is the end of the episode. We're going to wrap it here. Uh, if you haven't heard it lately, I'm going to tell you right now, your dreams should be real. And now you're responsible for going out and making them happen. We'll talk soon. Thank you for joining the tribe today. We would love to hear from you. Please don't forget to rate, like, and share. Perhaps someone you know could benefit from what we've discussed. Until the next time, remember that your dreams should be real.